Next, let's see some of the ways rich countries use their money to solve the water issues in their country. How would you build a city in a desert? How can you have a massive city with millions of people living there? Many of these countries also have lots of business and huge skyscrapers. All of that requires water. Think about it. Where are you going to get your water for all of that? Some countries, like here in Saudi Arabia, they use what's called a desalinization plant, which we'll learn more about that as well. But basically, you'll take the seawater and you put it through this big factory. It's all to take the salt out of the seawater, okay? And the kind of the situation there is, what, what does it require to remove salt from, uh, from seawater? Okay, you can't use a filter. So if you were thinking a filter, you can't filter out seawater. You can filter out the fish. You can filter out grass and sand and dirt, but you can't filter out the salt. So you actually have to uh, use a lot of energy. You have to heat it up, boil the water. Then the salt stays behind and the boiled water goes into the air, which then you can capture. And then um, basically, put it back together, you know, kind of like rain inside. And then that's the water that you can take and send off to people's houses. Water Corporation is the main supplier of water, wastewater and drainage services in Western Australia. It helps to ensure we have enough drinking water for the future by developing new sources, increasing water recycling and encouraging efficient water use. As our population grows, so too does the demand for water. Our drying climate means we need to find other sources of water now and into the future. I'm in Kwinana, south of Perth, and this is Coburn Sound. Behind those sand dunes over there is the Perth Seawater Desalination Plant. Built in 2006, it was Australia's first large-scale seawater desalination plant. Today we're going to take a look inside. Hi Oscar, how are you? Hi Siobhan, I'm good, thank you. Good. So Siobhan, tell us about seawater desalination. Seawater desalination is where we take the salt out of seawater to make it suitable for drinking. It sounds pretty straightforward. Yeah, in theory it is. I'm guessing seawater desalination is a good option because there's so much of it. It's also important because it's climate independent, which means it doesn't rely on rainfall. Most of the Earth's water resource, 97% in fact, is salty water found mainly in our oceans. The rest is fresh water. But a lot of it is frozen in glaciers and ice caps. That means there is less than 1% of fresh water in the world readily available to us. So it makes sense for us to use some of the seawater and turn it into fresh drinking water. I was on the beach earlier and couldn't see any sign of seawater coming in. Yes, I do have to warn you, you may not actually see a lot of water around the plant, but rest assured there is a lot happening in pipes, tanks and even below ground. For example, right here is where the seawater is coming in. So there's a pipe running from the beach up to this point underground. Not only that, but the same pipe goes into Coburn Sound for 200 metres. At the end, 10 metres below sea level, there is an intake tower, five and a half metres high, which is where the seawater slowly filters in. The top two metres have coarse screens that allow seawater to flow naturally through and fish to pass in and out. It then flows by gravity through a two metre diameter pipe until it reaches this point. Back to the process. What's the first step? Ah. The screening process is first up and that happens in these two units. Before the raw seawater can be processed through the plant, we need to remove some of the larger particles. Inside the screening units are mesh screens, a bit like fly screens, which trap things like seaweed. Next, it's time for some dosing. What stage of the process is this? After screenings, we add substances to help with coagulation. Coagulation. <laughs> coagulation. It helps smaller particles bind together to make larger particles, 
When it goes to the next stage, it's easier for these larger particles to be filtered out. The next part of the process occurs at the dual media tanks, which is a type of filtration process. So what's inside these tanks? In each tank, there's a layer of hard coal and a layer of sand. Both layers together take up about 1.15 metres, or one third of the tank. The water filters through each layer, filtering out the larger particles. Then it goes through these cartridge filters. Inside, they're like straws with very tiny holes. The water is pushed through the holes at high pressure. But haven't all the particles been filtered out already? Mostly. This is like a backup. Even small particles can block up and damage the reverse osmosis membranes, so we need to make sure they're all removed. In this building is the heart of the whole process, reverse osmosis, or RO. It's a bit noisy in here, so you'll need to put these in. In here, we have six high-pressure pumps that are pumping the water from the cartridge filters to the RO racks. Then, the filtered water passes through the RO membranes to remove the salt. In each membrane, there is a tube in the centre, which is where the desalinated water flows through. So, we end up with two streams. A desalinated stream, which has no salt, and a concentrate stream that has all the salt, making it twice as salty as the original seawater. The yellow cylinders are recovering energy from the high-pressure salty water coming out of the membranes. They use that energy to pressurise incoming seawater so that the pumps don't need to work as hard. The second stage of reverse osmosis further polishes or cleans the water and reduces bromide levels. Wow, that was impressive! Oh, sorry about that. What about all the salt that's now in the RO membranes? We have to keep the membranes clean by regularly backwashing or flushing them out. It must also take a lot of energy to run the plants. Yes, it does, but to make seawater desalination plants environmentally sustainable, we offset their energy requirements against wind and solar farms. So, can we drink the water now that it's been through reverse osmosis? Probably not a good idea. Although we've taken the salt out of the water, it doesn't yet have the minerals it needs to make it suitable for drinking. So, how do you make it good enough to drink? Ah, follow me. Once the salt has been removed, we remineralize the water in these purple pipes. So, inside are the dosing spheres. If you imagine a hedgehog whose spikes or spears are putting chlorine, lime water, carbon dioxide and fluoride into the water. Hmm. I understand chlorine disinfects water and fluoride helps prevent tooth decay. Mm -hmm. But what about the lime water and carbon dioxide? What do they do? Lime water helps maintain the necessary alkalinity levels in our drinking water system and carbon dioxide helps the lime water to dissolve into the water. In this tank, we're mixing the lime powder with water before adding it over there. Now the water is stored in this tank here before being pumped off-site. It can hold around 12 million litres of water, or roughly five Olympic-sized swimming pools. Okay, so does this water go straight to our homes now? Not just yet. In summer, first it will go to a reservoir where it mixes with groundwater before being treated again and then being added to our drinking water supply. In winter, when we use less water, some of it is added to dams. Okay, so we've seen what happens to all the fresh water, but what about everything we've taken out of the seawater? Where does that go? Once the coagulated particles have been removed, all the concentrate goes through a pipe out to sea about 500 metres and to a special diffuser system that mixes the concentrate with seawater. Ocean tides and currents continue to mix the water. Within 50 metres of the diffuser, the concentrate is back to normal seawater salinity levels. As you would imagine, there is ongoing monitoring of the ocean environment and reporting to the relevant environmental agencies. What you might not imagine is that some ocean life can flourish around this area. And finally, we have the control room. The processes are both manual and automated with multiple points of control. The plant is monitored 24 hours a day, all year round with stringent emergency procedures in place. 
and, along with other plants, water quality monitoring and testing is critical to ensure drinking water standards are maintained. Thanks, Javon. It's good to know that we have such a large source of water we can use without relying on rainfall. Yes, it is. But even though our two desalination plants can provide almost half of Perth's water needs today, they still cost money to build and operate. So we still need to be careful about how much water we're using. Well, after seeing how much it takes to make seawater drinkable, I know I'll be doing my bit. Thank you for the tour. No worries. See you next time. Bye. Bye. With a simple turn of the tap, water is there, free-flowing and abundant. But do we really understand the value of water? Do we know how much we consume or even where our water comes from? Abu Dhabi is a growing city in a desert climate. We have some natural freshwater resources, but not enough. So we turn to desalination. Desalination plants take seawater and use high pressures or temperatures to produce drinkable water. Desalinated water travels from the plant through an extensive network of transmission mains, storage tanks and pumping stations. It continues to ever-branching distribution pipes, community and individual storage tanks, more booster pumps and finally, out your tap, whenever you need it. Desalination is expensive and energy intensive and the brine discharged back into the sea disrupts fragile marine ecosystems. It's a technology we can't do without, but one we can control. By understanding its drawbacks and altering our behaviour, we can reduce the stress on our environment and resources. Every drop saved slows down our need for another desalination plant. Every one of us can make a difference. By using water more efficiently, valuing it and using less, being water wise, we can reduce Abu Dhabi's collective demand for water. This will help ensure a positive, prosperous future for ourselves, our families and generations to come. Now that you know why it's important to be waterwise, do you know how? Visit waterwise.gov.ae and we will show you. Next, let's take a look at the Nile River. The part we're looking at goes through three countries, Ethiopia, Sudan and Egypt. Ethiopia is a poor country where not many people even have electricity. They decided to build a dam on the Nile River to make electricity and have more water. What do you think Sudan and Egypt think about that? Why? Is Ethiopia doing right or wrong? What is the issue? How would you solve the issue? This is the Ethiopian Grand Renaissance Dam or GERT for short. Erected on the River Nile's main tributary, the Blue Nile, it took almost a decade to build and is meant to be part of Ethiopia's transformation. Roughly 65% of the country is not connected to the power grid. Energy from the dam could more than double Ethiopia's current output, fulfilling its needs and making it an exporter. But the dam is also highly controversial due to its location. The Nile's main source, the Blue Nile, starts in Ethiopia at Lake Tana. The river flows towards Sudan and joins the river's other tributary at Sudan's capital, Khartoum, before heading downstream to Egypt. Gert is being built here, on the border with Sudan, near the Blue Nile's source. The dam will catch water in its massive reservoir, whose surface area is larger than that of Greater London. This will inevitably have an effect on how much water flows to downstream countries Egypt and Sudan. Egypt is home to almost 100 million people who depend on the Nile for 90% of their fresh water supply. Some fear that Ethiopia will leave too much water in its reservoirs during periods of drought, endangering the flow downstream. That could leave Egypt's farmers unable to irrigate their lands, causing major food losses. And all this as the effects of a warming climate 
have already strained Egyptian agriculture. The effects for Sudan seem mixed. One fear here is that the GERD could jeopardize the operations of Sudan's own dams on the Nile. However, Sudan also sees an opportunity to get cheap energy from Ethiopia thanks to GERD, and it could regulate water flows that have sometimes caused flooding. These competing interests are among the reasons why negotiations over the dam's operations have been difficult. No comprehensive final deal has been reached. But even with an agreement, cooperation between Egypt, Ethiopia and Sudan will be needed for the years to come. There are more projects planned along the Nile, and the effects of climate change and growing populations mean water could be an increasingly scarce resource. For more, let's bring in Aya Ibrahim, who filed that report and has reported from the region quite a bit for a DW News. Aya, welcome. So clearly, negotiations are difficult, but what are the main sticking points? I mean, right now, the main sticking point is uh, Egypt and Sudan's attachment to whatever agreement comes out of these negotiations being a legally binding agreement. Um, uh, this has been very important for these two parties throughout the negotiations. But now Ethiopia is hinting that maybe this, they can discuss the these, uh, these matters, but the legally bi the legal binding aspect of the of the deal is suddenly now coming into question, and this is very important for Egypt and Sudan, uh, not because of the initial stages of the filling, which have which has already been completed, but their big thing is what happens if there's a drought, what if there's a prolonged period of drought. And they want Ethiopia to be legally uh, attached to releasing a certain amount of water from their massive reservoir to uh, offset the drought periods. But there's also competing economic interests. We're talking about three countries and they have their own individual uh, interests. Is that all there is to it or is there something else also afoot? I tend to think that the competing economic interests are perhaps the easiest part to understand of this conflict. The more difficult part to understand and the less tangible is that this is also about history and this is about identity. This is about who gets to set the rules about a very, very important asset for all aspects of life. Uh, I mean, you have Ethiopia, which sees Egypt, uh, Egypt's uh, claims to the Nile as colonial heritage that they completely reject. And you have Egypt who thinks who's, you know, the Nile is interwoven in Egyptian identity and in Egyptian history. And it's hard to think of Egypt without the Nile, at least to the Egyptians. There has been talk of war. Is there any risk of armed conflict over this disagreement? It's possible, but unlikely. And it's possible only because leaders of both Egypt and Ethiopia have not ruled it out completely. But if you look at the current situation, the fact that Egypt's parliament just last week gave essentially a green light for Egypt to intervene in Libya, Egypt now militarily at least has too much on its plate. And if they were to strike the dam, it can always be rebuilt again. And there's also the geopolitical aspect, which is that Sudan is right in the middle. So unlikely, but possible. You never Remains know. to be seen. You never know. Hi, Ibrahim. Thank you so much for coming in. For more, let's bring in William Davison. He's a senior analyst for Ethiopia with the International Crisis Group. He joins us now from Addis Ababa. Uh, Mr. Davison, what is the main sticking point at the moment? Um, well, there isn't one sticking point, but there is a sort of whole category of legal issues um, which are proving um, hard to overcome. And they're also related to outstanding um, disagreements over some hydrological issues. Um, and to give an idea of what I'm referring to there, um, as mentioned in your report, um, there is the debate over how to manage droughts, how the Renaissance Dam will operate in the event of a drought. So how much water will be released from the GERDS reservoir during certain categories of drought. Um, and then there are a number of legal disputes, um, notably on the issue of arbitration. So if there is a future dispute Will there be third party arbitration to resolve it? Ethiopia rejects that, but Egypt and Sudan insist on it. And then a major issue which really connects to all the others is if there are any future developments upstream of the GERD on the Blue Nile, how will that be factored into any GERD agreement? Um, because it will impact the amount of water flowing into the GERD. Um, therefore, there might be a need to adjust the agreement. But the parties simply do not agree about how to factor that in to the agreement at the moment. Considering uh, these sticking points, which country needs to be more flexible out of the three? I mean, considering that this dam has been built on the Ethiopian side of the border, is it Ethiopia that needs to be a little more flexible? 
I think um, everyone needs to be um, a little bit more flexible here. Just make whatever concessions uh, they find acceptable and will help to get to an agreement. Um, there's some quite tricky disputes, this issue of arbitration that I mentioned. That's a kind of binary disagreement. So it looks like maybe by um, improving a third party mediation process um, and other trust building mechanisms, maybe the focus can be taken off that dispute over arbitration. With regards to drought management, uh, Ethiopia has said that it wants Sudan and Egypt to also use their reservoirs to combat drought. So, you know, are Sudan and Egypt prepared to do that? Can Ethiopia come up with some proposals for how that will work? And maybe also Egypt could soften some of its demands about the amount of water it wants Ethiopia to release from the GERD reservoir during times of drought. Ultimately, everyone has to play their, their part uh, on this. William Davison from the International Crisis Group. Thank you so much for breaking that down for us. Thank you. This is the Blue Nile and the dam that Ethiopia has built across it. It has the potential to give millions of people electricity to transform the country and the reservoir is starting to fill. Downstream, Egypt, a country built around the Nile, is furious and worried. So why can't Ethiopia and Egypt agree on the Nile Dam? This standoff is about water, history and politics. It's about who sets the rules and it's about how these nations can be. Egypt's President Sisi says the Nile is a question of life, a matter of existence to Egypt, to which this is the reply. Needless to say, the Nile is as important to Ethiopia as it is to Egypt and the Sudan are the source of livelihood and economic development. No one doubts the wealth in the water, it's how you divvy it up. Let's begin with the country building this dam, Ethiopia. Work began in 2011, these pictures are from 2018. For Ethiopians, this is personal. They help pay for the dam through donations and loans, and the goal is to give electricity to more than 65 million of them who don't have it. Theirs is a grand ambition. In the words of its late project manager, to eradicate our common enemy, poverty. But can that be done without creating poverty elsewhere? The dam is on the Blue Nile, where most of the Nile's water comes from. It joins the White Nile in Sudan, and from there flows north to the Nile in Egypt, a country whose history and whose present intertwine with the river. The vast majority of its people live close to it. And from farmers to the foreign minister, Egyptians argue if the river changes, everything changes. There is no Egypt without water. We either have water or there is no future for us. Decreasing our water share will kill us slowly. A colossal project that Ethiopia has constructed across the Blue Nile could endanger the security and very survival of an entire nation. Now, Egypt has long had things its own way with the Nile. In 1929, Britain recognised Egypt's historical rights to the river and gave it the power to veto any future construction upstream. That deal was then reinforced in 1959, favouring Egypt and Sudan. Neither of these agreements made any allowance for Ethiopia. Perhaps not unreasonably, that still rankles. The 1959 agreement between Egypt and the Sudan has apportioned the entire waters of the Nile between the two of them. With Egypt securing the lion's share, leaving nothing, nothing for Ethiopia. But Egypt argues that historical agreement is still valid. Ethiopia is blunt on this, calling these claims the most absurd thing you ever heard. All of which helps to explain what The Economist describes as the toxic mood in both countries. It says Egyptians have cast Ethiopia as a thief bent on drying up their country. In Ethiopia, Egypt's portrayed as a neo-colonial power trampling on national sovereignty. None of which sounds promising. So we're left asking, who can resolve this? The Trump administration, the UN and the African Union have all tried to mediate, but there's still no deal. And Ethiopia is not waiting for one. Here's the evidence. This satellite image is from the end of June. Note the water to the right of the dam. Then this is mid-July. Ethiopia's confirmed the reservoir is filling up. Now, the key stumbling block to a deal is that Ethiopia is reluctant to put a figure on how much water it will release. Egypt, though, wants a guaranteed amount, even during droughts. Sudan also wants guarantees. 
It says, signing an agreement is a prerequisite for us before filling the dam. Sudan has the right to demand it. Maybe, but Ethiopia knows it holds plenty of cards. The It's My Dam slogan taunts Egypt and suggests Ethiopia is rather enjoying the shift in the power dynamic. Certainly, Ethiopians are. Clips like this have been uploaded to TikTok. You can see cups here representing Ethiopia, Sudan and South Sudan. They're filled with water. Then Egypt's share is poured out and the glass wiped clean. This leaves Ethiopians with a decision, whether to compromise. The dam is theirs, but the river isn't. Egypt told the UN Security Council recently, no nation is an island nation. And surely Ethiopia's Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed recognises that. He helped end Ethiopia's lengthy conflict with Eritrea by compromising. His political approach is often described by the Amharic term medema, which means coming together, rejecting dogma and promoting compromise. As the dam continues to fill, his commitment to that idea is being tested. If you like that report, there are lots more from me and the team here on the BBC News YouTube channel. All right, guys, thanks a lot for watching. If you have any questions, please talk to your teacher, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.